Rochim Abayim, welcome everyone. Tremendous opportunity, especially now with the Matzav in Eretz Yisrael, which I'm going to speak about, Bezrat Hashem, and the upcoming Chag, which is related, I'm going to show you this evening very much to what is happening to the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael and us in Chutz La'aretz. Friends, so much of life, so much of life, we don't even realize how much, is about timing. And it's hard for us, because we want things to happen in our timing. So there's our cheshbon, there's our accounting, and then we have a Kodesh Baruch Hu, God's timing, which doesn't always coincide. Sometimes it's years off. You're waiting years for some event to happen in your life. Sometimes it's months off. Sometimes our timing and Hashem's timing is weeks off, days. Sometimes it can be minutes or even moments. All of them are the same. There's what we want from life, our timing, and then there is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's timing as well. I'd like to give you just a start with a few light stories before I get very heavy and very deep. I want to lower you in so I can take you out Bizrat Hashem. You know, since Rabbi Fai is here, I must tell you a quick story involving him, which I've never told before, I think ever, let alone here at uh, Safra Synagogue. Many years ago, I was working for a Jewish organization. I'm a rabbi, what was I going to do? Dance? And um, it was going okay, Baruch Hashem. Class, Shirim, trips to Israel. I knew Rabbi Ruvain, we were doing stuff together, and we were doing stuff. And then I got a phone call, I still remember it, he doesn't remember it, but I doubt he does. And he says, hello, it's Rabbi Fahi. Wow, my father's calling me. He was in London at the time, and he was not working in the Bet Knesset. You don't remember this, do you? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm in the phone, and I answer the phone call, and he says, I'm calling from London. He says, there's a possibility I'm coming to New York to be a rabbi of a Bet Knesset. I'm not going to tell you which one, which was killing me, because I tried to figure it out. But I want to work with you. Now let me give you a little bit of background as a rabbi. I want you to imagine you're an actor or an actress and you're doing okay. You get certain movie roles, maybe get some plays to do on stage. And then one day you're sitting at home and you get a phone call from Steven Spielberg. And he says, is that? And he mentions your name. And you're like, yeah. And he says, I'm making a movie about a little three-foot alien. I want it to be in the movie. We're going to be like, nah, I'm busy. I'm working on a stage production off, off, off Broadway. He said, Shalom, I'll do it. I don't care. I'll play the alien. I'll play the alien's best friend. I'll take the back part. I'll be the screaming, dying. There's always one guy at the back who's always dying in the movie, you know what I'm saying? He gets killed in the first minute. I'll even take that. Any chance to be in the movie with Steven Spielberg. That is how I felt about him. I didn't tell him. I had to act cool, you know? I said, any chance to work? This is before he even got here. And then I didn't hear from him again for months and months. I don't even know how many months. And then my job where I was working went sour and I was not enjoying it at all. And he came back here and he was ready. The rabbi, the bed Knesset, I hadn't heard from him and he said, now's the time. Now's the time. I wanted it months before. It's all about timing. Let me get down to even just a couple of moments. You know, I've done many, many chatunot baruch Hashem, stood on many chupot. I can tell you one crazy story that happened to me. It happened publicly, so I can tell you publicly. I was standing under chuppah, and I had a premonition. It's never happened before, and it's never happened since. I had a premonition that the kala was going to faint. Do not ask me why. It just came into my head. This is one of the first chupot I ever did. So I was nervous as it was. There's a lot going on. You got family, grandparents, wine. Get, there's a lot going on. So I pushed it out of my head. I even remember it so clearly that when the kala walked under the chuppah, I even looked at her and said, are you feeling okay? And she was like, yeah, of course I feel okay. And then I kind of definitely pushed it out of my head because you're dealing with ketubah and wine and fat. As the ceremony is happening, I hear a loud groan behind me. And this is on video if you ever want to see it. And I turn around and the mother of the kala goes from this to this. And she falls. And as she falls, 
No one's catching her. And I'm the rabbi under the chuppah. So I said, you know what? I better catch her. <laughs> so there I am, one of the first chuppot I'd ever performed. And I'm like, what is going on? And I catch the mother of the kala as she faints under the chuppah. You see, I had a nevuah, a Ruch HaKodesh, but it wasn't exactly right. It wasn't the kala, it was her mother. And I catch her, and I look around, and I'm like, is there a doctor in the house? Not one doctor! Ribbana Shurulam! It's a khatuna! You would have thought, doctors! Plenty of lawyers. Oh, make no mistake. One girl puts her hand up and says, I'm a dental nurse. I said, her teeth are fine. She's fainted. So we're there, Tell we put her on. Basically what happened was, she was dehydrated and she drank too much alcohol, this lady, and that's why she fainted under the chuppah. So I'm tending with her, and I turn around to the kala, and she's standing. This, this whole thing has taken like five minutes to revive her. Right, the husband starts slapping her in the face, trying to wake her up during her daughter's chuppah. And I turn around to the kala, and I said, what should we do? And she said through clenched teeth, get on with it. After the chuppah, she said to me, is that a bad sign? This is a very common question. Is that a bad sign? Is it a bad siman that this thing happened under my chuppah, my mother fainted under the chuppah? I said, it's preparation for what you're going to do to her in the future, and what your husband's going to do to her, but we'll leave that aside. I said, it's not a siman ra. I said, we just needed five more minutes before the ring could go on the finger. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's got the timing down perfectly. Hashem knows exactly the right moment. Your mazal of being married <coughs> wasn't five minutes ago. It was five minutes later. That's how HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And I'm talking minutes. It's actually even seconds. Chuta Sara. And so I need to wait all those months to be miserable in my job to write far. He took me out and redeemed me from Mitzrayim and maybe work with this organization the Bet Knesset. It's all about timing. It's not even his timing. It's not like Karish Baruch Hu. I should put it into his head. There is no coincidence of the timing of the war that we and our people are in right now. It's not coincidence. It could have happened six months ago. It could have happened two years ago. And it happens now in this year. 5784, between Purim and Pesach, and I'm going to explain to you why this period is so obvious. It's so, if you just understood how the Jewish holidays worked, how these Chagim worked together and interplay with each other, you'll see it. Of course, Iran was going to bomb us right now. Rabbanu Shalom. It makes so much sense. To answer this, I need to ask another question. And that is, why does Purim occur Every year, no matter what happens, Shloshim Yom Lifnei Chag. Purim must always be 30 days for Pesach. Why? Why do I need that? Why do I care how many days? Do I care how many days between Shavuot and Sukkot? No. Each one has their own dates. Do I count the days in between? I don't do that at all. So why do we do that now? Oh. There are two Adars, like there is this year, it's a Shana Ubert, a pregnant year. And we don't celebrate Purim in the first Adar, which it probably should be. We push Purim another month, just so that Purim appears, Shloshim Yom Fenachak, 30 days before Pesach. That is the Halacha. Always must be. Why? Why do I need that? What is Purim all about, my dear friends? Purim is all about, if you remember, dealing with a Malek. That's the theme. The death and destruction of Amman, the death and destruction of all Amalek who want to wipe us out. That is what the main theme of Purim is. It is not, I'm going to be very clear with you, a ge'ula, a redemption. We weren't redeemed. We know that because we were still under the thumb of Ahasuerus even after the Purim story. According to some opinions, and it's kind of hard to believe, Esther HaMalka remained married to Achashverosh after it all. So it's not a story of Gula redemption, it's a story of survival. Just, just surviving, but not redemption. Unlike Pesach. And this is going to help us understand a very fascinating question the rabbis ask. 
Why do we not recite Hallel on Purim? Why is there no Hallel on Purim? You would have thought, right? Hallel, give thanks to Hashem. Thanks for saving us from this crazy Amalekite and his entire Mishpacha and his wife and his ten sons. That would be a real thing. Praise Hashem. Hallelujah. No. There's many answers given in Gemara Megillah as to why this is. Rav Nachman says, actually, there is Hallel on Purim. It's Kriyat Megillah. When you read the Megillah on Purim at night time and read again during the day, that is Hallel of Purim. That is our way on Purim of giving praise, thanking HaKadosh Baruch for saving us. So when you read, or if you hear the Megillah, Megillah Esther on Purim, really, you're saying Hallel, thank you Hashem. Cute answer, very nice, from the Gemara. Rava disagrees. Rava says, no, 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 no. I'll tell you why there is no Hallel on Purim. Because Hallel begins with the words, Hallelujah of the Hashem. Praise be the servant of Hashem. But it's not true. On Purim and after Purim, we were not Avdei Hashem, says the Gemara, Akati Avadim Laachashverosh. We were still Akati, we were still Avadim Laachashverosh. So we can't stand there and say, Hallelujah, Avdei Hashem. We are, we are now Avadim of Hashem, because we were still Avadim to Achashverosh in Paras. It wasn't a full gu'ula. For that, you got to wait 30 days. Because the full gu'ula, the full redemption comes on Pesach. Now then we go free. Then we get rid of Paro. We get rid of all of his chariots. We get rid of all of his entire army. And we all go free. And we make our way into the Midbar. Make our way to Matan Torah. And off there is Yisrael. Now that is a gu'ula. So let's get this clear, and let's bring this up to date, 2024. Purim le Pesach. There are 30 days between Purim and Pesach. The rabbis say that means there are 720 hours between Purim and Pesach. The gematria, the numerical value of a malik is 240. So 240 is a malik, 720 hours, 240 times three, that means three Amalek comes to 720, and that is the amount of hours. So the rabbis between Purim and Pesach. Between Purim and Pesach. Why Amalek times three? Because Amalek attacks us in many ways. Amalek attacks us through our machshavot, our thoughts, and through our speech. We speak like Amalek. Unfortunately, and Amasim, and we act like a Malik too. We're kind of bought into their system. And so we need to wipe them all out. The Amalik force that is upon us. You know, one of the final jobs of Mashiach, because there's a tradition, I should add, that Mashiach is going to wipe out a Malik. That's not even a tradition, that's mentioned in the Navi. Right? That's a major part of Judaism. But there's a tradition that's going to happen on Erev Pesach. That a Malik, and when I say a Malik, I mean the forces that want to destroy us openly like we're seeing today. We're seeing people rise their head above the parapet and say the most disgusting things about our people. Complete sheker. This is Mamash Malik. They want to destroy us physically and spiritually and emotionally and psychologically. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it's working. And the Rambam says, whoever acts like a Malik, we treat them like a Malik. And that is Iran today. And so it makes sense that dealing with Iran today, who is today's a Malik, without doubt, they'll be the first ones to admit it. They're proud of it. They want to wipe us out. Legamre, totally. This is the time of Michet Malik. It's between Purim and Pesach, said the rabbis. This is the time to rid a Malik. This is the time we have to remove them from having control over us. And one of the main areas of control they have over us, my dear friends, 
is in our emuna. That's what they love to do. They like to weaken our emuna, our faith in Hashem. They love it. They can't get enough of it, my dear friends. That's what gives them chizuk. Breaking our faith in ourselves, in our Kaddish Baruch Hu, in our families, in our safety. That's why days and days, we're going to attack you, we're going to attack you. People are freaking out. They're breaking our spirit. That's why the word for Amalek has the same Gematria 240 as Safek doubt. They love to sow seeds of doubt into our minds. Are we really meant to be doing this? Are we really? Maybe we are the bad guys. Maybe the me. We've all thought it for a moment. Maybe we are the bad ones. Everyone's saying it. Maybe they're right. They're not. We are the holders of Emet. We're the final bastion of truth in the entire world. This is who we are. We need to rid of Malek. And the way to get rid of a Malek is one thing, says the Chafiz Chaim, there's many ways. And that is Lashon Hara. We're going to have to improve our speech somehow. It's so difficult. You know, I say radical, and I, I, I apologize for even saying this, but I really believe this to be true. You know what's happened over the past few days? We've all stopped speaking Lashon Hara about each other because we're too busy speaking Lashon Hara about Iran. It's ironic, isn't it? Your conversations, you're not talking about what she's wearing, what he's doing, what they're worth, what they said to you. Who cares about them? I don't care about my neighbors. They can do whatever they want. They're trying to kill us. So Hashem is like, oh, you want to show you that you can actually overcome your desire to talk smack about each other? I'll give you all a united enemy. You can talk about them instead. It's unbelievable. I mean, I haven't done a study on this, but I guarantee the amount of Lashon Hara that has been spoken about Am Yisrael from Am Yisrael has been reduced greatly as we're just talking Lashon Hara and smack about our enemies that want to kill us, which makes sense. If you're going to choose the two, I'd go for our enemies. It can't be a coincidence. It can't be. And that is going to be the secret to our Geulah. The secret to our redemption is going to have to be working on our speech. And I apologize for talking about this a lot. And I'll be honest with you, I speak Lashon Hara. There isn't a single person in this world that doesn't. I also like it. It's enjoyable. It gives us chizuk. At least one day a week, just give a little extra thought to the amount of Lashon Hara actually speaking. At least Shabbat, at least during the Sudot of Shabbat, where we know, says the Benish guy, every Avera is worth 1,000 times more. Not good, right? So save your Lashon Hara for Monday morning. If someone has something bad to say, say, you know what? I really want to hear what that family is up to. Let's discuss it Tuesday afternoon. Call me, I'll be available. At least push it away. Be doche. Right? You could push the fast days away from Shabbat in order to keep the sanctity of Shabbat. I think we could doche. We can also push away the Lashon Hara. Try to keep the Shabbat table kadosh and pure. It's tough, I know, because you're there and family, a kibbutzing and schmoozing. But more important is the Pesach Seder. Try to keep it positive and happy and a And the way to do that, my dear friends, is to prepare. Please, I beg of you, don't just turn up to your Pesach Seder and open the, blow the dust off the Haggadah and start talking. Just open up for just a few minutes, a few days before, a few notes, read through the little stories at the bottom, have a couple of questions to ask. Dayenu. That's all you need. Try to make a matzav, but try not to have. You can even say it. You can be from for three hours, however long it takes you. Please, Pesach Seder, no Lashon Hara. After Pesach Seder, Lashon Hara. But then I'll be too drunk and tired, so I won't have the patience anyway. Try to keep it naki. It'll make a massive difference. Because my friends, right now, this war happened at a time of Michet Malik. There is a window of opportunity. And I'm going to finish with the words of the Prophet. I have so much more to say, but we have other wonderful friends and speakers who are going to talk to you this evening. The question I've been asked again and again and again since October 7th, but definitely in the past couple of days, and mostly Goyim, embarrassingly, you keep asking me this, is this Gog and Magog? Every Jew suddenly obsessed with Gog and Magog. And you know what I say to them? I think it is. And I just look at the words of Yechezkel and Navi. Ezekiel the prophet, I'm going to read the words in black and white. He said it, it was put inside Tanakh, it must be there for us to read. 
And Hashem says, I'm going to lead your enemies, that's our enemies astray. I'm going to put hooks into their cheeks, which is a metaphor to mean I'm going to drag them into a place they really don't want to be. And I'm going to bring them out with their entire uh, enemy and with horses and riders and ballistic missiles and drones. It's all the same. In splendor. And there's going to be a vast assembly with shields and helmets. And then it goes on to name the various nations of Gog and Magog. I don't know who these nations are. Kush, Put, Gomer, Torgama, different opinions who these people are. But there's one name I do recognize. And it's the first name that is mentioned of Gog and Magog. And that's Paras, Persia, one day Iran. It says it. The prophet's telling, he's talking to us today. They were not a problem for thousands of years. Well, out of the blue, Pitom suddenly, in the past number of years, and now past, in the past few days, we much see Paras become the biggest thorn in our sides. For centuries, if not millennia, one of the biggest brazen attacks against our people in centuries, I don't know what to tell you. Mamash against our homeland. It's here. The ending is good. Because Gog is Gag. Gog is Gag. What's Gag? A roof. They are the roof people. They think we are safe. Nothing in us. We have a secure roof. And we are the Gag of the Sukkah people. That flimsy roof because we put our faith not in our roof, says Rav Hirsch. We put our faith in a Kaddosh Baruch Hu. That's what we need to work on. Our speech, because we know that speech leads to Galut exile. And we put our faith in a Kaddosh Baruch Hu. And that's Emunah. That's what we need to be working on. And everyone's got to figure out themselves. For some people it's more Torah. For some people it's more Tefillah. For some people it's not speaking about Kaddosh Baruch I don't know. I don't know. You've got to figure it out yourself. And if you want to talk to me, you can be available. You can speak to me, I make myself available to you to discuss it where you need to work on. Everyone needs to work on something right now. We're not fighting the war. We're not even in Eris Yisrael. You can't even fly to Eris Yisrael. They've cancelled all the flights. But what we can do is work on the inner Amalek that wants to destroy us. Wants to break through. Put seed, sow seeds of doubt into our minds, into our neshamat, our pure neshamat. My friends, this is the time. There is a window of opportunity right now for us to have a full gula. Hashem opens these windows and He says, I'm going to prove it to you very clearly. This is the time. There have been various to kufot through history we know, the rabbis tell us. I think this is one of them. I truly believe it is. And therefore, let's meet the most of the opportunity. Let's turn to our Gorosh Baruch with tefillah, with simcha. Let's try to keep our seder clear and good and happy and argument free, I know it's difficult. You're dealing with kids and grandparents. That's a toxic mixture. But there's an opportunity for amazing gula as we go from Purim to Pesach and Golowing this time next year. Bezrash Hashem, and I really mean this. We'll be talking and celebrating in Eretz Israel in the safety of not a single missile in the entire world in existence. Hashem should bless you and your families. Hashem should bless our brothers and holy sisters who are in Eretz Israel, who, is who are in receiving end of whatever is happening. And Hashem should make them all be safe and secure. Bim Hereb. Amen. Chag Tashev Sameach.